Good morning, everyone. My name is Connor, and I'm Representative Chrissy Houlihan's Communications Director. I'd like to thank you for calling in to our eighth virtual town hall during the coronavirus pandemic. Today, we will be focused on mental health. Um, if you have a question at any point throughout the town hall, please press star three on your phone. Again, that's star three. You'll be transferred to one of the Congresswoman staffers who will then take your question. We're going to do our best to get to all the questions today, but if we are unable to, given time, we will make sure to give you a call back within the next 48 hours with an answer to your question. Again, that's star three. Given our topic is mental health, we would ask that the questions sort of center around that as we have experts on the line as well. Now, for a moment, I would like to do a Spanish-speaking portion for our Spanish-speaking listeners on the call. Buenos días y bienvenidos a nuestra conversación acerca del coronavirus. Si ustedes recibieron esta llamada, es porque ustedes viven en el sexto distrito de Pensilvania y la congresista Houlihan les representa en la Cámara de Representantes. Porque solo tenemos una hora, no podemos traducir el discurso. Así que les recomendamos que visiten el sitio web de la congresista Houlihan en houlihansuapellido.house.gov. houlihansuapellido.house.gov. Después hagan clic en el botón que dice Coronavirus o en español y van a encontrar una página con gráficos y texto. Para ver los recursos totalmente en español, tienen que desplazarse hacia abajo. Como recordatorio, tenemos hispanohablantes en cada a piscina, así que no duden en llamarnos en Reading a 610-295-0815 o Westchester a 610-883-5050. With that, I'd like to thank everybody and hand it over to Congresswoman Houlihan. Thank you, Connor, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. For some of you all, I, I hope you have come back for other town halls. And for those who are new, I very much appreciate your time to be able to talk to you today for our eighth coronavirus virtual town hall. Our office is very much committed to keeping you up to date with accurate information. And I know that there really has been a lot of conflicting information going around. And so we convene these calls largely with leading experts on our front lines in our community so that we can all have access to the best possible information about smart steps that we can all take to not only help mitigate the spread of the virus, but also the effects of all kinds of the coronavirus. I would recommend through this hour, if you have a pen and paper that you have it ready, uh, because you might need to be able to take notes of any contact information or other resources that are provided in this call. Today, as we mentioned, we are gonna be focusing on mental health. Uh, but before we dive into that, I wanted to take a moment to discuss some of the work that we're doing in Congress regarding the outbreak of the coronavirus across the country and in our region. I returned to Washington a few weeks ago to help pass the fourth coronavirus relief package. This was the Bipartisan Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act. And this legislation included a number of priorities that I had been advocating for on behalf of our community, including the PPP, which is the Paycheck Protection Program, funding that was set aside for small and community banks to ensure that these loans make it to the hands of those for whom the program was designed, which are the smallest of businesses upon which our economy here in Pennsylvania is built. I hosted a number of roundtables and town halls with those small businesses, and it was very clear that the PPP system was failing to reach those smallest of businesses in our community and across the country. So this most recent legislation aims to make it easier for those businesses to access that capital. The bill also included robust funding for hospitals and healthcare workers who are on the front lines of mitigating the spread of this pandemic. It also expanded eligibility for EIDL, which is the emergency uh, loans for agricultural producers who had not been included prior, like our mushroom and dairy farmers. And it included a requirement for a national comprehensive testing strategy, because I believe that that is essential for us to be able to feel comfortable leaving our homes when the government uh, has decided we're open. To safely reopen our country and return to some sense of normalcy, we definitely need to swiftly implement a comprehensive national testing strategy. And in order to execute that strategy, we need a team of dedicated civil servants who can carry out the testing, contact tracing, hopefully even vaccination and more. And that's why I'm leading a national bipartisan coalition calling for the creation of a national public health corps to help aid our frontline healthcare workers on the ground and across the country. 
I'm a former AmeriCorps member, and I'm also a veteran, so I know really what it takes to serve this country, and I know how hard those on the front lines are working to mitigate the spread of this pandemic. So we need to do everything in our power to support their efforts. So I uh, join others in urging the administration and our Congress to move expediently in creating this vital national public health corps. The most recent legislation that we passed builds upon the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which is called the CARES Act for short. It, as I mentioned, is a historic bipartisan stimulus package that delivers urgently needed relief to those in our community and across the country who are being impacted by this virus. Here are just a couple things that the CARES Act provides. It provides a direct payment for up to $1,200 per taxpayer and $500 per child for many Americans. And it provides an additional expanded $600 per week for every recipient of unemployment compensation for four months and extends what unemployment compensation is available to people to many more people than were previously uh, eligible for it. It provides $5 billion for Pennsylvania for additional resources to cope with the pandemic, $200 billion for hospitals and healthcare systems and health research, about $350 billion in loans for PPP, $17 billion for debt relief for small business borrowers in the form of EIDL loans, $10 billion for disaster grants, and $100 million for PPE for our nation's first responders. It also provides a temporary deferment of payments towards principal on federally backed student loans and stoppage for interest accrual for six months. It waives the payment, the 10% penalty on early distributions from retirement accounts, allowing people who either are diagnosed with COVID or who are economically harmed by the virus to access their savings for immediate needs. And it provides evictions for renters and foreclosures for homeowners. I'm sorry, it prohibits evictions for renters and foreclosures for homeowners with federally backed mortgages. And lastly, it ensures that COVID testing is covered by all private insurance plan with no cost sharing. That's what happened a couple of weeks ago. Yesterday, the House released what is now called the HEROES Act. It clocks in at 1,800 pages and another $3 trillion. And I'm in the process of digesting this whole bill and evaluating how I will vote on our behalf. I spent the day yesterday listening to each of the committees of jurisdiction review what had made the cut in their various parts of the package, and I will likely be traveling to Washington to vote on this next package this coming Friday. In broad strokes, the next package is, as the title indicates, honoring the frontline heroes on testing and tracing to be able to safely open our economy. And it also spends a lot of resources in putting money into the hands of those who are struggling right now the most. And that, of course, means our businesses or individuals, state and local governments and municipalities, and our communities. We don't have time, as I've mentioned on previous calls, for partisan politics, certainly during a pandemic. And I'm continuing to work aggressively across the aisle with the administration, with the Congress, to make sure I'm doing right by Southeastern Pennsylvanians and Pennsylvanians and to make sure I'm honoring my oath of office to protect our community. At the local, state, and federal level, we are taking action to rapidly flatten the curve. And by staying home, as we all know, we're buying time for our first responders. We are genuinely called at this very difficult time to be our best selves. And this is, as I know, and I've seen in our community in Chester and Berks County, about behaving for each other, about protecting friends and neighbors, and about protecting ourselves. You can follow some of this on my social media in following the hashtag In This Together campaign, where we're trying to highlight some of the amazing stories of people around our community and how we're all coming together and helping with helping one another. These are constant reminders of how uh, remarkable we are as a people, and it is one of the most uh, important reasons why I'm so proud to call myself a Pennsylvanian. I know how hard this is as a former chief operating officer of a business in our community to uh, be operating a business in this very, very difficult time. So if you and your business are struggling, please do reach out to my team. 
We have created special uh, pods in our teams to be able to address your issues, and there is one uh, that is focused specifically on small businesses. And this may be where you might need a pencil or pen if you are uh, in that category. You can reach out to my team at PA, like Pennsylvania, 06.smallbusiness at mail.house.gov. Again, it's PA06, like the 6th Congressional, dot small business at mail.house.gov. Our offices are following CDC guidance, and so we are all offer, operating remotely via telework right now, but our phones and emails are still open, and our work very much continues, be it around our coronavirus crisis or about our traditional constituent services or legislative agenda. And we've set up, in addition to the small business team, some other uh, specialized pods where we can be helpful to you. There is one specifically for unemployment questions and for help from my team on unemployment-related or compensation-related questions. That email is PA06 as well, dot unemployment compensation, and again at mail.house.gov. We also have set up a, a, a team for taxes and rebates questions, which again would be PA06 dot taxes and rebates at mail.house.gov. And if you have general questions or would just like to talk about any of the issues we're legislating on, you always can reach us at 202-225-4315. So that's what's happening in Washington. But today we're going to be focused on our community and on mental health because although the virus is definitely a disease, uh, it is causing ancillary uh, complications and repercussions both in our economy and also in our mental health as well. I supported and helped pass a number of measures in the CARES Act, which will help support our community's mental health. And just briefly, some of those include $425 million for the Substance Abuse, Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, $250 million to certified community behavioral health clinics, many of whom are in our community, $50 million for suicide prevention programs, $100 million for emergency response spending that can be targeted to reach people such as those experiencing homelessness. And I've also been thinking, of course, about our healthcare workers who are on the front lines. Uh, some of you may know that my brother is currently serving as an ER and surgical nurse in Iowa, so this is very personal to me. And these workers are on a special kind of battlefield. So it's crucial that the federal government is here to help them. So I'm part of an effort to create a grant program within the Health and Human Services to provide mental health assessments and treatment for our frontline and healthcare workers. We are asking the HHS to carry out a comprehensive study on healthcare worker mental health and ways to improve it to prevent long-term mental health issues related to the involvement in this response. We definitely believe that none of us should be left behind because of this crisis. In terms of our call today, uh, rather than answer all of your questions myself, because I'm certainly not an expert on mental health, I've invited some local leaders and health experts who will be able to brief us on the coronavirus and how we can better take care of ourselves and our loved ones during this pandemic. So today, I'm very, very pleased to say that we're being joined by uh, Connie Malafarina, who's the team leader and chi in child and adolescent services at our Berks Counseling Center up in Berks County. And we're also being joined by Debbie Thompson, who's the executive director of National Alliance on Mental Illness in Chester County, part of our Chester County team. So the tr structure of our town hall from here on will be as follows. First, Connie and Debbie will speak to what they've experienced on the ground in our community and will give us some resources to be able to provide our people in our community who are struggling. Following their remarks, which will be around uh, 9.50, we'll take, or I'm sorry, a little bit later than that, we'll take some questions. So to ask a question at any point in the call, just please press star three. And this will transfer you to one of my staff who will be able to take your questions and put you in the queue. So that, or as a reminder, is star three. And with that, I will say thank you so much. I will turn it back over to, uh, I'm sorry, I will turn it over to Connie, who will be able to give us some of her opening remarks. And thank you so much for joining us. Hi, this is Connie Malafrina. 
Um, I think most of us have never experienced anything like this in our lives. So feelings that people are having, feeling scared, angry, depressed, anxious, are normal. The most important thing about feelings is to validate your feelings, validate the feelings of others. A lot of people are also experiencing grief. Many people associate grief with the loss of a loved one, but there's all kinds of different losses at this time. Um, not being able to see family and friends, uh, not being able to celebrate important moments in life, even just weekly activities. Um, a lot of people have lost jobs, maybe had to close small businesses, and a lot of times people's identity and sense of purpose are tied to their jobs, so they may feel like they have no purpose at this time. Kids also, that's what my team works with. Um, parents are struggling because the kids are out of school. They, they're not sure what to do. Kids may express their feelings by acting out um, and other behaviors. So it's very important to talk with children about this, not minimize their losses, not minimize their concerns, because for them they're important. They need to be heard. They also need structure and boundaries, which parents sometimes are finding difficult to do and maybe even more more so during this time. They need to be given choices. They need to have a say. It's also important for our adults to structure their day, even if somebody's not working. Um, setting times for different activities, a time to get up, a time to have meals, different uh, things that you're going to pursue during the day. A lot of people might be having anger, looking for somebody to blame. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are spending too much time on uh, watching the news or on social media. While it's important to be informed, it, people can easily get overwhelmed. I had a coworker that this happened to, and once I talked to her about limiting the amount of time watching the news, she felt much better. Uh, people can do this by you know, distracting themselves. It helps to focus on out, things outside of yourself if you're too much in your head. So like breathing, meditation, doing some different grounding techniques such as like counting things, uh, just naming categories of things like TV shows, etc. Some warning signs to look for in yourself, your children, or other, fo other people. Sleeping too much or too little, isolating, eating too much or too little, an increased use of alcohol, drug use, angry outbursts, being abusive towards others, not taking care of yourself like your physical health, showering, you know, brushing your teeth, etc. Things you can do to help yourself and others, get outside for some sunshine and fresh air. Being quarantined does not mean you have to be stuck in your house. Sunshine is actually a natural antidepressant. Get, a, get some exercise, even if it's just a short walk. Build some breaks into your daily routine. Stay connected with others if at all possible. Um, we, find, I, we found with our team, once we started doing face-to-face -face meetings, it was so helpful to everybody. They felt better. Volunteer. There's so many things you can do. Look for things you, you, you know that you might be interested in. Make sure you're eating healthy meals and snacks instead of binging on junk food. We here at Berks Counseling Center are still providing most of our services. We're using phone and things like FaceTime and Zoom for both individual and group sessions. We continue to take new clients. Uh, our psychiatrists are still doing evaluations, medication management. We're even doing wellness services um, via the phone. One resource that I'd like to mention, um, I, I know it's in Berks County, I'm not sure about Chester, is the 211 service. It's a free confidential information and referral service. It's geared to help people connect with the human and health services that they may need. Just a reminder, though, it's not an emergency service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connie. I really very much appreciate that. And as a reminder for those who have questions related to mental health, you can press star three. And with that, I would love to turn it over to Debbie from our Chester County. Hello, this is uh, Debbie from NAMI, Chester County. Uh, thank you for inviting us to be on this call. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, just wanted to check my phone. Um, okay, I've been with NAMI for about 16 years, and I'm their local executive director. NAMI is a national organization dedicated to educating, supporting, and advocating for persons and their family with mental health. Uh, I would agree with just about everything Connie said. Uh, many of our local NAMIs are in the process of either engaging in virtual support groups, 
um, continuing to man our telephone calls. Um, incoming, we have 211 uh, in Chester County, just as in Berks. Most of the calls that I have received or emails have turned into lasting relationships where I have one gentleman who calls me every other day and we have coffee together to talk about what's going on in his life. Um, I've been working with also the local business community with bankers uh, who have been dealing with families who are dealing with excruciating financial um, problems and they've been referred to me. So part of the, I think the resource that I'd like to make sure everybody has is to go to our national website, which is www.nami.org. And there is a quite an extensive COVID-19 resource and information guide. And it gives you uh, practical information where you can go to get reliable information. It gives you activities that you can participate in um, and helps refer you to other organizations that you find are quite helpful. Mental illness is, a, is an illness just like any other illness, and this COVID-19 just adds another level of challenges that families and persons have to deal with. So I would say make sure if you are in need of support that you're checking out your local NAMIs, you can do that through the national website, again, that www.nami.org, and then you can enter their websites as well. So every NAMI is different. Um, you're free and welcome to go to any of those websites uh, to access their services. So I think it's probably most important to see what the questions are that um, the audience has. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Connie, so much. We're going to switch over to the question and answer portion now. Um, we've got a lot of questions in the queue, so I would like to start with Liza from Morgantown. Liza, you should be on the line now. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, I just want to start out by saying that, Chrissy, I cannot thank you enough for your efforts and your team's efforts. You have handled this beautifully. And I just want you to know how grateful I am. I've been on almost every single call, and you amaze me with how fantastic you've been. Um, Thank you. I have been on before, and I've um, asked questions before. This one now pertaining to mental health. I'm a small business owner, and obviously this has been quite a roller coaster ride and continues to be one. Um, I am a mother of three boys, and my oldest, um, my two older ones, 16 and 12, they're the ones I'm finding I'm struggling with the most. Um, being that they're doing this online schooling, I'm finding their grades are dropping. I'm trying the best that I can to manage their schooling and staying on top of their work, much to their <laughs> dismay. Um, and then also trying to manage my own business and what I'm doing and how I'm navigating this whole experience that way. And it's been incredibly overwhelming. Um, and more specifically with my oldest, who's 16, um, he's really, really struggling because he's not seeing his friends. And um, he's actually even begun to question, like, his own mortality. He's not suicidal in any way, but he's definitely questioning death. And, um, you know, I, I think the media definitely plays into that with all of the news, and I think cutting back on that is a great suggestion. But um, really experiencing, like, what it means to just all of a sudden be sick and die or that he could lose his grandmother. Um, I think all of these things are playing into his anxiety. And I've reached out to the school, um, guidance counselor, that sort of thing. They're aware of it, but this is his junior year of high school. His grades have plummeted. He was, he's a, tra he's a, a, an athlete. He does track and football. He's disconnected from those things at this point. And so I'm really concerned as a parent, I'm struggling to keep him motivated <laughs> and um, to keep him positive and understanding that the grades still matter, that this is not summer break, and that the schools and colleges are going to look at this year, and he doesn't think they are, but they are. So that's where I am. I'm kind of all over the place with it a little bit. 
Liza, th thank you so much for the question and for opening uh, up so much about that. I know that uh, I have three girls. Mine are in their 20s, but I remember that time in high school, uh, and I really appreciate your anxiety and concern. Um, I, I guess uh, one thing I'll tell you is that we are going to be doing a special event just for parents on these kinds of issues, and so you should know that you're certainly not alone. But I was hoping I might be able to turn this over to Connie, uh, who, of course, specializes in kids, to see if she can also suggest some other resources and ideas. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you're finding the same thing a lot of our parents are. Um, I think you need to, you know, first place, be open and honest with him. Uh, you know, he's 16. He knows he knows what's going on. Um, I would try to encourage him to have some kind of structure. I have one 15-year-old uh, that I'm working with, and she was struggling with her schoolwork. So I suggested build some kind of structure because kids right now, they, they might be staying up late playing video games, you know, sleeping half the day, and that's what we're finding with some of them. And unfortunately, some parents are not uh, trying to put that, the boundaries and the structure in. So I think having some kind of routine is one of the biggest things that, that kids need to know that, hey, you know, you, yes, you still have to do your schoolwork. Um, I had a kid in fourth grade, the parents said, uh, you might not, do you want to repeat fourth grade? And he's like, no. So then he finally started doing his schoolwork. So you know, again, he does need to understand that this is important, um, you know, but have, like, build some breaks in. The kid that I'm working, the girl that I'm working with, she found that doing her schoolwork later at night, she's not a morning person. So, you know, she was doing much better, you know. Um, if he's struggling, I think most schools that I'm aware of, they have they can connect with their teachers and email with questions and stuff. So I would encourage him to do that. Um, you know, build some breaks into his schedule too. Encourage him to keep connecting with friends. Um, like we, like I said, we found with our team once we we started doing Zoom with our team, and the first time we did that, it was just everybody just kind of looked at each other. It was just so nice to see everybody. So we didn't really accomplish much, but just that time to be able to connect, even though they can't, you know, physically connect with friends. And, you know, give yourself a break. It sounds like you're doing everything you possibly can, um, you know, and it's normal for him to feel worried about his grandmother, think about his own mortality. So, you know, don't minimize it. Don't, like, brush it off. Like, he may just need to sit down and have, like, a serious discussion about it. Encourage him to, you know, to be educated. But, uh, again, people go on overload, especially if they go, like, there's so much stuff on Facebook, even in, the you know, the news and Everybody gets too overwhelmed, and uh, so I I hope I helped answer your question. Uh, so Thank any you, Connie, and, and we'll also yeah. at the end of the call, I'll give you guys an e, uh, a URL for our our website, uh, congressional website, which has some resources as well for parents too. Uh, and and I really uh, can sympathize and empathize with you. Thank you so much for your question, Liza. I think Connor, we have another question. Yes, our next question comes from Anna Maria in Reading. Anna Maria, you should be on the line now. Hello, my name is Anna Maria Crossview. My question was, I am a caregiver. I am totally afraid to go out to the clients because of the ex I can't say that word. Uh, and I feel like a... I'm a loner type because I was doing caregiving for uh, 12 years, and I feel so sorry for the people who does have this uh, coronavirus disease. And I know Jesus is there helping, and I always do pray morning and night to Jesus to help those people out. And like I said, I do. I am. Um, I do have this disease. A a H uh, A H H disease that I can't really read too good and spell, but I can do my job very good because I love people. 
And and Anna Maria, I think that you're. Thank you so much for your question, and and obviously for your compassion and for what you do. I think that one of the things that you, it sounds like, are struggling with is, you know, how do you move in this, uh, in the world right now where you're a caregiver and you're potentially, you know, worried about your own safety and your own health. And so some of the things that I can give you in terms of advice is that, and and guidance if that's helpful is that it, uh, it sounds as though that you're a professional caregiver. And so if you're a professional caregiver, uh, the way that the current rules are working is that you're, uh, you still um, need to speak and work with your employer because you, if your organization and your work is still open, uh, there's this sort of expectation that you're able to continue to work. Uh, but if you uh, want to have other information about unemployment or eligibility to, you know, take care of yourself, I would recommend that you go to uh, a website that I'm going to be giving you guys right now, just so if you want to write it down. It's uh, www.uc, which stands for Unemployment Compensation, .pa, of course, for Pennsylvania, .gov, like the government, so UC dot pa dot gov and the backslash there is covid dash 19 backslash and so that's the information that you can look at to understand the different sorts of scenarios by which if you are worried about continuing the work that you're involved in the kind of work that you do that you can you can look that up i also would encourage you to work with your employer as well we all know that we're all in unusual situations and circumstances and perhaps there's some sort of accommodation that you guys can come to uh, also for those who are on the line who are uh, involved in various professions of one form or another. Some of the legislation that was passed said that if you are home, as an example, either you yourself are sick or you are caring for a loved one or a child who is sick, there is accommodation for what amounts to sick leave in some cases for some sorts of businesses. And so this is another one of those places where you can access information. Uh, thank you so much, Anna Marie, for your uh, heart and for your uh, question. And I think we have another question coming up now. Yes, we do. Our next question comes from Excuse me. Our next question comes from Barry from West Grove. Hmm, let's see. All right, we are having a technical difficulty moment. Uh, there we go. So Barry, you should now be live, Barry. Barry, do we have you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Okay, great. Please ask your question, sir. Okay. What I'm, you know, what I am wondering is when the unemployment compensation is going to start coming out for people, because it's been almost seven weeks since I've had a pay from my Uber driving, and I sign, I was able to sign up in. Um, April 23rd, but here we are on May 13th. I've still seen nothing. And I'm just hoping that somebody can talk to somebody at the unemployment office and say, look, just get the money out there. People are hurting. Hi, hi uh, Barry. That uh, I very, very much appreciate your question. And uh, what I would encourage you to do uh, offline after this conversation is to please reach out to our office so that we can be of help as well. Um, as we all probably know, although the unemployment, you know, kind of uh, guidelines were passed through the CARES Act at a federal level, each all, each of the states has as their mandate to sort of translate that into their law and also execute on it. And different states have been able to execute on it with very various degrees of, of success. And uh, Pennsylvania, which doesn't give us any solace, is probably amongst the more successful in terms of our execution on it. But that doesn't mean that it's working properly and your point is correct in that you've filed it's been quite amount of some amount of time and you haven't received anything so please do reach out to us again at that email pa06 dot unemployment compensation at mail.house.gov Barry so we can help you um, 
Uh, it, importantly, you should know, and I know it's probably no solace at this point in time, but your unemployment will be backdated so that it will be retroactive to the time when you uh, filed and when you were unemployed. So I hope that that's helpful. And please also know for those folks who are on the line, like Barry, who is uh, an Uber driver, the new compensation, the new unemployment compensation was expanded to include things like Uber driving, which is considered to be part of the gig economy. So prior to this, unemployment was not uh, people were not eligible for unemployment compensation in those kinds of categories. An example is um, if people are, are working independently or as, as Barry is, as a gig, uh, gig worker, thankfully we have the opportunity to apply, but we definitely need to make sure that people are receiving those resources. Also, Barry, when you reach out to us, let's make sure that we talk about the, uh, the uh, rebate as well to see if there's uh, if that has been shaken loose too. I think today uh, up and until or may, uh, you have the opportunity to, to update your information on um, the Get My Payment, I think, website, and then we can get you information about that, about the, the rebate that folks are eligible for, assuming that you uh, earn something less than $75,000, that rebate is $1,200, and then it's scaled back from there too. Uh, so please do reach out and, and not just bear but anybody else who's in this situation so that we can be helpful as well. Uh, thank you for your question, Barry. I think we have another question, Connor. Yes, our next question comes from Jill from West Reading. Jill, you should be on the line now. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I'm a licensed professional counselor in Why I'm Missing. I have my own practice, and my specialty has been in grief and loss, and I appreciate what everyone has shared about that in terms of what's happening right now. My concern is down the road because I hear from my clients a real concern about going back into things. And I think part of it behind that is knowing they're not going to feel the same. And, you know, the symptoms of grief are difficulty concentrating, um, difficulty making decisions, depressive states, and anxiety, um, I, that's going to affect our workplace. And that this is all going to have residual effects down the road. Um, I also work with people who are nurses at ICU, and they're just not even processing what's happening. They just keep going. So I guess I want to ask, if there's been any talk about how we address that mental health as we go on <laughs> down the road um, or put a plug in that we need to be thinking about some kind of programming as we move forward um, because grief is a two-year process. It's not going to just go away. Thank Jill, you. Th That's yeah, it. Jill, th thank you so much for your, your question and for what you do. And I uh, concur. And some of the things that we're trying to do at a federal level is to make sure that we have some of the resources that will feed down to the state and local ev levels and for, for resources. But I'd love to kick that over to, to our panel to see if they have any ideas of kind of what the long-term um, uh, ideas are for making sure that we are taking care of each other as we hopefully open our economy back up. I know uh, this is Connie. I know we're a member of National Council, and National Council has provided a lot of things, resources uh, for us that we can use to help people. I was just on a, a meeting yesterday uh, about children and adolescents, and it was excellent. There were so many other professionals, uh, counselors, um, social workers, et cetera, who were on the call and had a lot of ideas uh, that we were sharing. So I don't you know, that's one thing. And National Council, it's the National Council for Behavioral Health. I know um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services also has, they have a lot of uh, resources available too. So I think uh, some of the things that I'm seeing is that we're getting emails almost daily about different resources specifically related to, to COVID-19. So, um, and I, I agree with uh, with your with your uh, talk about grief uh, that's one area that I have a great interest in, um, and you're right. People are not; they're just go, they're just going, 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 going. You know, those people on the front lines, and it's going to hit them later when things subside. You know, same thing with some other people. So it's you know, there's going to be a lot of residual 
mental health issues from this. And I think we're all trying to gear up and be prepared when, you know, when that happens, because after we are back to some sort of normal, people are going, you know, going to be experiencing, I think, some increased symptoms. So we're all preparing for that time. I don't know. Uh, uh, sorry, Debbie, I was on mute. Con con thank you, Connie and Debbie. Do you have anything to add to that to this conversation? Well, I would suggest that, like with NAMI and our, su our support groups, many of us deal with grief on a regular basis. It's not just – it's the grief of the loss of um, – you know, life as you'd hoped it would be. So grief is a normal part of our family support groups um, and and our peer-led support groups as well. There's also a, a program called Grief Share that is like a national program that operates in many of our local churches. So that um, I think this is just a, a conversation that we have to bring up to the top and start talking about it more frequently than uh, we have in the past. There's been a grief support group at one NAMI, maybe not at another, but this is going to be a topic that I think Jill absolutely makes a valid point. We need to start talking about it and make plans for it over the years to come. So I would look to, uh, when I get off the phone, I'm going to send an email to um, the NAMI leadership to plant that seed because maybe uh, out of this call we can do something to, uh, you know, help uh, develop a program that can go out to all of our local uh, NAMI affiliates. So thank you, Jill. I appreciate your sharing. Absolutely. Thank you, Jill. And we, we had a, a question from William from Berwyn. Unfortunately, he had to jump off, but his question is one that I think I'd like to make sure I bring up anyhow. He wanted to talk and ask about the importance of engaging virtually. And as we all know, we've all become experts in Zoom and go to meetings and a variety of other kinds of things, but not all of us have figured that out. I, I really think that this is an excellent idea. And I was hoping to ask our panelists if they could share some of the best practices that they have learned over the last you know, couple months of how to connect virtually. Uh, particularly, I'd love it if we could focus on seniors who may be feeling isolated, uh, especially those who may be in facilities or uh, isolated in their homes and not be able to see a family member directly. So would you all, the, uh, Connie, let's go with you first, be able to comment on what has been working for virtual engagement in your opinion? Um, we've, we've mostly been using Zoom. I know our IT department is looking at some other things. Uh, I have a couple of folks that are using DoxyMe. They've also used FaceTime. Unfortunately, we have a lot of older older folks uh, with Medicare who do not have access to the, the virtual, so we're, we're still trying to connect with them by phone. Our staff has been instructed to anybody over 60, anybody even if they're under 60 with pre-existing conditions, to reach out to them weekly. So we're just even if it even if we even if it's not a session we can bill for, it's just the importance of us being able to connect, helping them, you know, um, answering questions just so they have some kind of connection. So um, that's you know that's one of the things that we've been trying to do. We're working on some other, you know, looking at some other things that we might be able to do um, because we don't people don't have that capability. So, thank you. And, and Debbie, would you be able to uh, tell us some of the best uh, processes? Well, with NAMI, uh, with NAMI, we're all at different um, levels of expertise as it comes to virtual uh, meetings. Chester County, we're still uh, working on developing our support groups and things. Montgomery County's a little bit further ahead, uh, and our national organization has just given us a list of best practices and what they expect from their affiliates as they run their support groups on the virtual, um, in the virtual world. So we're still struggling. We're a little bit in the learning stage, just like everybody else, but uh, we're trying to bring everybody along with us. Because um, what I'm finding is that not everyone um, has the skills to bring up the virtual community. So. Again, we're working on it. Um, kind of stay connected. That's why we're doing telephone calls, emails, having lists so that when we get back on the and are able to do virtual support groups that we can reach out to people 
and stay in touch with them. In the meantime, our national organization runs some great support groups um, but on the national level. So, again, go back to that uh, www.nami.org. That's the best source of information on all things mental health and support. Uh, thank you, guys. And I, I guess what I'd like to add from my personal experience in terms of the virtual world is that um, it is uh, it is helpful to set up regular times. I know in my household we have a regular time that we call or FaceTime with my parents who are uh, together but, um, but separated from us and but with my mother-in-law as well. And I think that they rely on that and they appreciate that. Um, my, I, I think we have another question as well, uh, Connor. Yes, our next question is from Andre. Andre, you should be on the line. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Andre. I live in Burst County. My daughter works for the Wernersville State Hospital, where the stress level on workers has gone up tremendously lately with the advent of the coronavirus pandemic. My question is, is anything specific going to be done for healthcare workers in state hospitals? who are underpaid compared to the private sector and have to deal with not only with the care of mental health patients, but also with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hi, Andre. I'm going to take a, a crack at that from kind of a, from a federal perspective and to say that I absolutely uh, believe that right now our front line, uh, we are in a war. It's a pandemic, of course, and the, and the, and the enemy is COVID, and I believe that as a veteran myself that our frontliners are um, on the front line in this particular case as well. So I've been pretty aggressive on this issue. Uh, on, in the HEROES Act that we were talking about that is on the floor right now for consideration, there is a very big uh, element to it which provides very strong support for our frontliners with a trillion provided for state and local uh, and uh, territorial and tribal governments for frontliners who need to make sure that they're being able to be paid and compensated. It, it also establishes a $200 billion HEROES Fund to make sure that people like your daughter are able to receive hazard pay. So it's important that we think about these, these folks who are really defending and, and, and serving on the front line as heroes, which is why the bill has been named the HEROES Bill. And hopefully some aspects of that will get through not only the House, but also the Senate. Um, I've also helped lead what is a, basically a GI bill, you know, similar to the GI bill for um, our service members, for frontline workers that would provide an additional $25,000 in education benefits for essential workers. So for those of us who uh, maybe have loans that need repaying or even family loans that need repaying, uh, this is kind of in honor and service similar to the GI bill to recognize the service of that frontline. Uh, I would like to turn it over to the panel, though, to talk a little bit about um, uh, mental health for frontline workers as well. Um, we, at Berks Counseling Center, we do take most insurances. Uh, there's very few that we don't, so uh, we and we are still open for intakes. So if somebody, you know is struggling, they can certainly call us. Our phone number here is 610-373-4281. Um, and we, we have someone here answering phones from about 8.30 till 5 every day. But if nobody answers, they can leave a message. But we, we do take a lot of insurances. We are still taking new clients. So if there's somebody who's really struggling and feels like they might need somebody to talk to, to you know, to, for the extra support. Um, we're trying to do, one of the things I can't stress enough is self-care for those on the front line. Um, I'm emphasizing that with my staff because uh, I have some people also struggling with being isolated, uh, you know, some health issues that people have, uh, issues about family members, you know. So even even our staff who work with mental health, like your daughter, we're, you know, people are still struggling with increased anxiety and depression. So the best thing is, that, you know, reach out for help um, and m m ask her to please, you know, do do some self care. Take care of herself. If she can't doesn't take care of herself, she's not going to be able to care for other people. Thanks. And I think that was Connie. Debbie, do you have anything to add to that? I can honestly tell you I do not. Um, 
I really do not have anything to add to that, but I think uh, Connie's suggestions were valid. Um, Andre, your daughter might also want to just check in with the Berks County Mental Health Department and uh, see what services they offer, because I know sometimes they can um, provide services um, to persons um, at the hospital. And again, it's a, a good... Uh, I hear what you're saying, and I thank your daughter for all that she's doing and you in supporting her. So um, I will look further for information uh, on that. So, I, And I, if I find something, I will absolutely give it to Connor. Okay? Thank, thank you, guys. And I think we have Connor. Speaking of Connor, I think we have one last question. We do. Andre, thank you for your question. Our last question today, and just a reminder, if we didn't get to your question, there are some more in the queue. We will have a staffer call back to you with an answer or point towards a resource that you can utilize. Our last question today comes from Mary from Oxford. Mary, you should be on the line. Mary, do we have you on the line? Yes, you do now. <laughs> All right, perfect. The floor is yours for your question. Thank you. I didn't understand when you're giving the um, www.nani, would you spell that out? Because I'm unfamiliar with that. Absolutely. It's uh, N like Nancy, A like Apple, M like Mary, I like ice cream, NAMI. And I uh, and thank you very much for that question. And I, I think I'll take advantage of that opportunity to also give you some other resources that are available as well, um, really briefly. Uh, we have a very dedicated part of our website that is focused on this particular issue as well. And if you have your pencil as well, it's uh, located at houlihan.house.gov. And my last name is spelled a little bit untraditionally. It's H O U. L A H A N, again, dot house, dot gov, like the government. And then with the slash, backslash services, backslash coronavirus, backslash local, dot htm. And I'll say that again because there's a lot of really good resources here. It's Hulahan, H O U L A H A N, dot house dot gov slash services slash coronavirus slash local dot htm and the things that are on this website are tips for taking care of yourself if you're an emergency responder some guidelines for parents for helping children cope with emergencies and stress some resources for veterans for how to manage stress uh, resources for domestic violence and how to find help resources for our disability community, how to take care of your health, uh, behavioral health tips, uh, such as social distancing and quarantining and how to do that. There's also a mental health support line at that, at that area, uh, as well as child uh, support line, and some information about adult protective services. So there's a lot of really, really rich information there. The last thing that I would say is that if you or someone you care about is experiencing an emotional or mental health crisis, there is also a Valley Creek Crisis Center available here in our area at 610-280-3270. Again, that's 610-280-3270. And there's also a Chester County warm line, which just basically is something in Chester County if you'd like to talk to somebody. And that phone number is 866-846-2722. So that, again, is a warm line. And the last thing I will go with before wrapping up and concluding is that there is also a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It is one 800 Two seven three eight two five five. Again, it's one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five, and a veterans crisis line one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five, and you press one. And finally, uh, for those in the LGBTQ community, the Trevor Project has a crisis line as well 
one 488 7386 And we will make sure all of this is up on our website. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Connor. I, I believe we are probably heading into some final remarks. Yep, that's it. Um, so, Christy, I'm going to hand it back to you in a second. But just a reminder, um, if we didn't get to your question today, we will have a staffer call you back within the next 48 hours. I want to thank everyone. We had about nearly 3,000 people on the line today for today's Mental Health Town Hall. This is the Congresswoman's eighth virtual town hall during this pandemic. So we really appreciate you all joining in. Please continue to check for updates about our next one. And with that, I'll hand it back to the Congresswoman. Thanks, Connor. And I really do want to thank everyone for joining us on our conversation and about a very serious subject. And hopefully you found some resources and some help and also some community here. Uh, I want to very much thank Connie and Debbie for their time and for their service to the community uh, before this and during this crisis. Uh, as we can tell from these calls, it's very critical to have conversations like these, and it's very essential that we destigmatize conversations surrounding mental health and understand that we need to provide information and to support for all of us who are struggling. Across our offices, which are located in Reading and Westchester and DC, we are working very hard uh, to protect our communities and to make sure that we have clear and consistent uh, guidance and ideas to make good decisions about our health. So as you've heard today, it's very, very important that we take care of each other and that we take care of ourselves, both physically and mentally. Uh, as we've heard today from so many of us, this has been a very abrupt change in our daily routines. And please do feel free to reach out for help if you need it or if those that you love or know do too. Uh, we are certainly all in this together. And this is not about any one of us, but rather about our community as a whole. So we know that we can work together as a united front to mitigate the spread of the virus, but we can also work together to make sure that we're taking care of each other as well uh, mentally. So here are some of the things just as a reminder that are uh, allowing us to get ourselves out of this. Uh, in addition to all of the resources that we've talked about from a mental health perspective, please remember to wash your hands regularly. Please remember to practice social distancing and keeping uh, six feet away from you. Uh, please remember that you, at this point in time, if you're in Chester and Berks, you can really only leave your home for essential purposes, and we will be uh, on that status until around June 4th, according to our governor. And please, as I mentioned, do reach out to anybody who's struggling and reach out to us as well if you are. Uh, with that, I'm very, very grateful to conclude this town hall. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to serve the community, and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you.